Meanwhile, the workforce also went through a gigantic transformation. Between the end of the Civil War and the early 20th century, something like 10 million Americans moved from farm to city. We remember immigration from abroad, which of course is tremendously important, and some over 20 million immigrants arrived from abroad in that period, but 10 million moved from farm to city, which is also a major population movement within the country. And of course, by the 1890s, the origins or the source of immigration was radically changing from the, what we call the old immigration, that is people from Ireland, from Germany, from Britain, from North Scandinavia, Northern and Western Europe, being replaced by the so-called new immigration of uh, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, people from the Tsarist Empire, Jews from there, Poland, people from Italy in large numbers, Southern Europe, and of course on the West Coast, people from China and um, Japan also until Chinese immigration is stopped in uh, 1882. Um, but these immigrants flood into cities. Cities become, the manufacturing cities become the center. You know, before the Civil War, manufacturing is done in the countryside, right, on the rivers. Now you see, we see the rise of the great manufacturing cities. Not in New England so much as in the Great Arc, I don't have a map here, if you can imagine the Great Lakes, around the Great Lakes develops the greatest industrial center of the world, from Buffalo to Pittsburgh to Cleveland, around to Chicago. That's where the great factories are, that's where the industrial, the, the modern industrial cities, mostly populated by immigrants, are, um, are, 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 are taking root. Um, and. Um, this is the period of the classic working class. That is the, the manufacturer, the big, you know, people have an image of the worker, the big, brawny, male, white, ethnic, industrial worker. That is not the working class today. Today, far more people work in McDonald's than work in steel factories. Um, the largest employer in the country today is no longer the Pennsylvania Railroad, which it was in the 1870s, or General Motors, which it was in the 1950s, but Walmart, right, which has, I think, about a million employees. So the entire, but that's a whole other story. The entire nature of the economy today has shifted, you know, fundamentally from, what, from this great industrial era that will follow the Civil War. But also, but what is familiar is this was also an age of tremendous inequality, unprecedented in American history until today when we have managed to get back to the statistical inequality of the 1890s, um, where basically 1% of the population owns as much wealth as the other 99%. Uh, where, or certainly than the 50% than the at the bottom. Um, and uh, this has, of course, become very prominent nowadays through the, uh, the, the widely publicized writing of the French economist Thomas Piketty. You may have seen, he's all over the place. He's on TV, he's appearing everywhere. He was even last week on the front page of the New York Times style section, which is unusual for an economist. Maybe not a French economist, but an economist. It wasn't for his, you know, tailoring that he was on there. It was because Piketty's work, Capital in the 21st Century, has somehow struck a chord and become the latest kind of in uh, book that everyone has to read and should read. But it's quite unusual for a book by an economist full of tables and footnotes to strike a chord. But as you know, I'm not telling you if you don't know, the, um, the, the concern about inequality is rife today as it was in the 1880s and 90s. Actually, American workers certainly had higher wages than their counterparts in Europe in, the, in this period, but the problem was, first of all, they worked far longer hours. Uh, for example, steel mills worked on 12-hour shifts. The steel mills were operated 24 hours a day. One shift was 12 hours, then another crew came in for 12 hours, um, six days a week. Um, the accident rate was higher than anywhere else in the industrial world. Far more people were killed in, let's say, coal mining accidents in the U.S. than in other countries with large numbers. There was no regulation, in other words. There was no income tax to um, try to, you know, drain off some of the income of the very, very 
top. Um, and as I say, it's a period of ups and downs. Even the most skilled workers often are out of work. Uh, work is, so, so that, um, so that th all this contributed to the inequality. But my main point really is not about the economic statistics, but that these developments posed a crisis for the free labor idea, which had been inherited from, the civil, from before the Civil War and had triumphed in the Civil War. The free labor ideology was sanctified by the North's victory. And yet, somehow, a free labor society was not developing in the direction that most people had, uh, had expected. The first challenge to the idea, to the implementation of a free labor society was Reconstruction itself, as we have seen. Um, which raised in the most direct way, what does a free labor society mean? Can a person who is impoverished, without land, without economic options, be considered a free laborer? What kind of governmental assistance, if any, ought to be uh, ex extended in order to assist people in getting up into the position which the free labor ideology always you know, looked to of economic independence? Not just work, but being economically independent, owning property, owning a shop, owning your own uh, business, owning your own farm. That becomes more and more difficult, first of all in the South and then increasingly in the rest of the country also. Um, what is the relationship, in other words, between political freedom and economic freedom? That question, which is still debated today, was posed in the most direct way by Reconstruction, but then it is equally posed by the transformation of the North, where violent class conflict shatters the assumption of the free labor tradition rooted in the notion of the harmony of interest between labor and capital. With people violently assaulting each other on the streets, the harmony of interest doesn't appear to be an adequate way of describing uh, society. One might almost say that the free labor ideology itself shatters along class lines. Um, so what happens, I think, in a way, is a battle over the legacy of the Civil War and emancipation. What does free labor mean in an industrial, modern industrial society? Um, one group, most of business leaders and their supporters, academics, uh, many government people, political politicians, n subtly transform the idea of free labor into an exaltation of contract. The contract is now the essence of free labor. The, a contract, the, the labor contract, in other words, agreeing to work in a situation, that is the embodiment of freedom, of free will, of voluntary action. The laws of contract, says one writer, are the foundation of civilization. The end of slavery, therefore, in this view, is seen as a transition from coercion to contract. Slavery is coerced labor, but people who voluntarily agree, whether it's a written contract or just taking a job, who voluntarily agree to a labor situation, those are the ones who are truly free. They have made a free choice. And so long as economic processes are governed by contracts, full, freely arrived at by autonomous individuals, people have no grounds to complain.